everybody. Thank you for joining me for a quick chat on reclaiming predictive data with Knowledge Graphs. My name is Amy Hodler. I love all things network science and graphs. Uh, I work for Relational AI, which has a cloud native relational knowledge graph. Uh, we've recently come out of stealth. Uh, also uh, recently gained a award from Gartner uh, as a cool vendor. I, and we have a few things to cover in a very few minutes here about uh, wasting data, hopefully not wasting data, and using Knowledge Graph to capture more predictive information. So first, something that I think uh, all of us have said and probably have heard, if I only had better data, I could improve my predictions. I could uh, increase my predictive list. Now, the interesting thing in that is you actually do have more data than you realize. And it's more about whether you can access it and utilize it in your machine learning pipelines. Most of us actually realize we already know how to improve our models. We either improve our data or we encode knowledge somehow with, uh, within the system. So if we're looking at improving data, uh, that is very aligned to data-centric AI, where we are trying to increase the quality of our data, get it richer data in order to get better results. Uh, and if we look at encoding uh, knowledge, we have, we're already doing that today. Many different ways to do that, data cleansing, data sampling. If we're telling uh, the models what to look at, we are encoding our own knowledge as far as what's important for, for the model. And then more advanced uh, things such as feature engineering, uh, manual label, weak supervision, uh, you, where you're generating synthetic data for your model to look at, all of those ways to encode knowledge. So either improve your data or you encode knowledge to build better models. But what's the first thing that we actually do when we're getting ready to make a predictive model? Unfortunately, we steamroll our poor raw data. And what that basically does is it flattens structures and we lose domain expertise. Think about all of the organizational data you have. Think about, actually, just think about your data where you have put time and effort into figuring out what are the hierarchies, where, where it's the important meaning, what, what should be weighted and uh, taken into consideration more, uh, what, how does one thing map to another, what are the dependencies. And all of that information gets flattened uh, when we go to create a feature matrix. And so we kind of throw out that important information. And even more than that, we toss out the relationships between things themselves. So when we translate things into a feature matrix, when we're doing that feature engineering, we usually assume that each entity is independent of each other. Now, if you think about the real world, things are exactly, are, are exactly the opposite. They're highly dependent. So if we're trying to make a recommendation on uh, perhaps uh, what kind of uh, bicycle component uh, an online shopper may want, knowing how that's related to what they've purchased in the past. Do they have a high-end bike? Uh, do they have um, just a frame and they need all of those subcomponents? Do they Are there services that, that might be interesting based on what they have done before, how they are related to other uh, functions, how they are related to other people, actually? Uh, so we don't want to lose this information, both the uh, you know encoded domain expertise and these relationships themselves. And you might say, well, that's just a couple items, not a big deal. But think about what we're trying to do in machine learning. We are trying to represent a model of, uh, of a system, of our world, and then make predictions about it. So if you start taking away components, you just can't get as far. You're limited uh, by what your model may look like. If you have a very shallow model that doesn't really represent, fully represent your system, your predictions aren't going to be as rich. Uh, so the first thing is, don't waste data that can improve the quality of what you're putting into your machine learning. Uh, and for example, corporate data, uh, really valuable. We have tons of it, but we don't really use it uh, very well in machine learning. It's difficult and we need to figure out how to capture business logic as part of our models. Uh, we also need to look at different types of machine learning and breakthroughs on things like images and text that maybe we could replicate or at least try to replicate on relationally organized data. The other thing that we should absolutely be looking at are the relationships themselves. Um, just like we were talking about with, uh, with bicycle buying behavior. Uh, we know based on years of research that relationships are the strongest predictors of behavior. Several books here, really great. I recommend them. Uh, but you can use that knowledge 
to say graph feature engineering is something you could do to improve your machine learning results like right away. Uh, it's a very much a low hanging fruit. So how do we grab this information and what can we take advantage of? So the other thing is to, to look at data and knowledge that's already encoded and not waste that. So a lot of people are talking about semantic layers, semantic models right now, kind of an old term that has a new twist uh, today. But what we're really talking about is mapping data to its business meaning. Like what is the importance of this, of this data? What does it mean? How is it related to other things? What's the logic that I should surround uh, this data with. And people are doing that today so that they can do things like streamline development of applications. So they can streamline all the pipeline that they might have to do in order to get that kind of intelligence into data apps. Uh, there's a really great blog post here at the bottom you can check out for more information. But let's say that you are grabbing that information, you're grabbing that related data, you're encoding that knowledge, you've got some semantics there. You can then use a relational knowledge graph to feed that predictive data and that knowledge into a platform like Snorkel. So for example, uh, if you think about what a relational knowledge graph is, it is basically a model of concepts, their relationships, and the associated logic together in more of an executable way. So this example actually is uh, taken from a Google case study uh, on Snorkel. Snorkel Dry Bell was the, uh, was the name of that. And they used a knowledge graph as part of their organizational resources to capture information and then feed it into, uh, into their machine learning and their uh, the results. Now, if you're using a relational knowledge graph because it has that logic embedded natively, you can also use that not just for typical knowledge graph relationships, but also to add in heuristics, business roles, as well as semantic organization. So what we're trying to do at Relational AI is bring together all of that rich corporate data that you have and your domain knowledge together in an executable way so that you can then feed in and streamline uh, creating things like more complex, more intelligent data apps, but also run more complex analytics such as graph analytics, reasoning, uh, machine learning, uh, and certain types of knowledge sharing. Uh, so a relational knowledge gra graph makes a perfect pairing for a modern data stack so you can build more intelligence into what you do. If that sounds interesting, please reach out, say hello. Uh, I love to talk to people about anything to do with, uh, with graphs and knowledge graphs. Uh, also, if you're interested in getting a sneak peek of a relational knowledge graph, want to get early access, uh, go to relational.ai. You can sign up for our newsletter and you'll be notified uh, when, uh, when you can access that. So thank you. Appreciate your time and goodbye for now.